Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative solicitation webinar. My name is Samantha Anderson, and I am a program manager at the National Policing Institute and part of the RVCRI team. Today, I'm joined by a couple of our partners and colleagues, one being John Markovic, a senior policy advisor with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, Amanda Burstein, Div Division Director for the National Policing Institute, and John Connolly, Senior Program Officer for Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. A few logistics just before we get started with today's event. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the ruralvcri.org website for future access. We will send out a notice to all attendees once that recording is posted. We have uh, muted all attendees to prevent background noise. At the end of today's webinar, there will be a brief evaluation survey, which should only take a few minutes to fill out. We do encourage you to fill that out if you're able to. Your feedback always helps us improve for our future events. Throughout today's webinar, you will see two polls pop up on your screen. Um, one will ask you about your familiarity with grant funding, and the other will ask you what you are hoping to fund if awarded with an RVCRI grant. At the end of today's presentation, we will be answering questions. Um, so if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put them into the chat or the Q&A feature that you see along the bottom of your screen, and we will plan to answer them. For today's webinar, uh, we plan to answer a, a couple of questions for you. One is, what is the Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative? Uh, from here on out, I am going to say RVCRI. Who is the RVCRI team? Who is eligible to apply for an award? Um, what are the responsibilities if awarded? How do you apply to be a grantee? What are you allowed to submit for in terms of budget? When are applications due and how you can reach us if you do have any questions following today's webinar? So our first poll will be opening up on your screens momentarily. It is gonna ask your familiarity with grant funding. Um, so has your agency received any kind of grant funding in the past? Your answer options here are federal, state, local. You haven't received any or you're not sure uh, which kinds your agency has received in the past. All right, I, I do see a lot of active participation already on the poll there. It looks like um, several of you have received grant funding in the past, pretty, pretty evenly split between federal and state grant funding there. Um, okay. Thank you all for taking the time to respond to that. Reggie, I think you can close that poll out for us. All right. So it seems like some of you have had some grant experience in the past. Um, some of you are new to uh, the grant world. So we will talk about um, some options and some um, best practices as we go throughout here. So the first thing that we wanna talk about is what is the RVCRI? Um, it is a competitive grant and training and technical assistance program uh, to support law enforcement agencies who are addressing violent crime challenges in rural populations. Um, so these grants can support various aspects of policing, including improving investigations, implementing violent crime reduction strategies and enhancing collaborations between local stakeholders. Uh, the objectives are to help you in addressing those rural violent crime problems that you've identified, to help you fund and deploy various resources uh, to address those problems that could include personnel, services, or analytical tools, to document um, how those resources are being deployed and how they're impacting the violent crime that you have identified. Um, Awardees will have access to not only tailored TTA from subject matter experts to ensure successful strategy implementation, but you will also have access to a provider who's dedicated to helping you navigate the grant world and the reimbursement process. Um, in addition to that, you'll have access to no cost training and technical assistance opportunities, uh, knowledge sharing events, peer to peer networking and a variety of other resources. Awards will be competitive in nature and can range from $25,000 to $150,000 and will cover of a maximum of a two-year period. Um, on the screen here, you can see what the grant can be used for. We've talked about a few just briefly there, the train, hire, and deploy personnel, expanding victim services and community-based crime prevention programs, enhancing your crime analysis capacity, 
implementing problem-oriented policing and improving your collaborations with your partners and stakeholders, as well as purchasing and deploying technologies uh, that would directly address those violent crime challenges uh, that you've, you've identified. So that's a little bit about what the RVCRI is as an overview. Um, we currently do have 21 direct funded grantees in the program, and you can see a map there displaying them across the country. Um, they are a mixture of police departments and sheriff's offices, and they're implementing a range of initiatives. So some are focusing on deploying ALPRs to help address their violent crime challenges. Others are focused on CIT programs, um, while so others are doing an officer in residence program. So with that, we'll start introducing you to who the team is. So as I mentioned, I have a few colleagues on the line with me today. Um, the RBCRI is funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is the grant making component of the Office of Justice of Programs under the Department of Justice. And BJA provides leadership and services and grants administration, policy development, and they support state, local, and tribal justice uh, agencies in their goal to achieve safer communities. Um, I will turn it over to John Markovic from BJA for any opening comments. John? Thanks, Samantha. I'll keep this brief. I just want to welcome you to the webinar and thank my colleagues at LISC and the National Police Institute for putting this together. So we're really excited to present this grant opportunity. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with the term micro grant. It's used differently in different places. But the main difference is that with this micro grant program, you are not a direct awardee of the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance. You will be essentially, the money will be passed through either LISC or NPI. This was patterned after a small rural and tribal micro grant program that we ran, that we've run for about a year and a half now. And what that does, it enables smaller agencies, rural agencies, the, the small rural and tribal micro grant program is open to small agencies, regardless of whether or not they're rural, rural agencies and tribal agencies, unlike this, which is focused on rural, but the, the principles are the same, the basic guidelines are the same, that the purpose of micro grants is to allow smaller agencies that are not that grant savvy, who can't compete with our regular direct funding often, on an equal level, an opportunity to seek grants um, among like-sized peers. So this is born of appropriations language um, to address rural violence. Um, we have a fairly open-ended definition of rural. You should be working on a problem that affects a rural population. So you could be eligible, let's say, if you're Harris County, Texas, which surrounds um, the Houston area, but also covers rural areas. So we cast the that fairly wide. Um, and this so this is really purpose built around rural violence and it's particularly well suited for smaller agencies. I noticed that 40% of you have had federal grants before. Some of those may have been passed through grants. Some of them may have been competitive grants. So we welcome you on board, but we also welcome those of you who are new to the grant process um, we're really providing a lot of handholding for you um, that you wouldn't get had you been a direct, directly funded agency in one of our uh, competitive grant programs, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, that is. So with that, I'll turn it back to Sam. Great. Thank you, John. Um, wonderful. So I will turn it over to a few of my other colleagues to introduce the remainder of the RVCRI team. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Amanda. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. My name is Amanda Bursi. I'm the Director of National Programs here at the uh, National Policing Institute. Uh, we were formerly known as uh, the National Police Foundation, if that name is more familiar with you. We recently underwent a, a name change after 50 years of, of being in this business and kind of reevaluating um, how our name represents what we do. But just to give you a, a little bit of background about our organization, we're the oldest nationally known nonprofit, nonpartisan and non-membership organization dedicated to improving uh, policing through science and innovation. Um, we've, as I mentioned, we've been around for over 50 years, um, and we were originally established in 1970 with uh, funding from the Ford Foundation. Uh, so 
It's our mission to uh, conduct research, but also provide training and technical assistance, particularly bringing evidence-based practices to the field. Um, and through this program, we will be doing much of the same. As John mentioned, um, it, this is an opportunity for our team and our partners uh, as training and technical assistance providers uh, to really uh, bring and make federal funding uh, really accessible to uh, rural, tribal, and smaller agencies uh, through this opportunity. And while there will be requirements uh, similar to and, and requirements because it is federal funding, you uh, will get the benefit of the support of uh, MPI and LISC through this process. So we will be here to help uh, you through that and to try and make it as smooth as possible for, for you all to participate. So we look forward to working with you in the future and uh, answering any questions you might have. And I believe I'm going to uh, provide uh, a little information about another partner that we have on board. Uh, we have partnered with the Small and Rural Law Enforcement Executives Association, which is a fairly new organization, um, but uh, their mission is to look solely at supporting and promoting law enforcement executives and agencies uh, in the small rural and tribal communities. So uh, again, just trying to ensure that our training and technical assistance is going to be very tailored for your needs and uh, the goals that you have outlined for your particular uh, agencies and potentially for the funding through this initiative. With that, I believe I'm turning it over to John Conley at our partners at LISC. Thanks so much, Amanda. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be with you today and excited um, to have an opportunity to talk about uh, the Rural uh, Violent Crime Reduction Initiative Program and this particular grant opportunity. Uh, again, my name is John Conley, Senior Program Officer with the Safety and Justice Team at LISC. Uh, LISC, for those that uh, may not uh, be familiar with our organization, stands for Local Initiative Support Corporation. We're a national nonprofit. We're one of the country's oldest and largest community development intermediaries. So what does that mean? We marshal public and private resources uh, and funnel those uh, in the form of grants, loans, and equity investments um, to community partners in the field. Um, historically, those partners have been community development corporations or CDCs, uh, but it has grown to include a number of other nonprofit and for-profit uh, partners. These partners are often working hand in hand with one of our 40 local offices across the country or one of our national programs. Uh, for example, Safety and Justice is LIST's oldest national program. Uh, and we have supported dynamic cross-sector partnerships, tackling stubborn uh, public safety issues in over hundred neighborhoods uh, across the country and communities across the country since 1994. Uh, LIST's approach is really meant to be comprehensive in the types of community and economic development investments we make in areas such as housing, businesses, safety and justice, public spaces, schools, health centers, uh, and, and more that really try to catalyze opportunities uh, in communities nationwide. And specifically uh, of interest to folks on the call today, we want to make sure that we uh, highlight that LISC also has a rural program that serves over 2,400 rural counties across 45 states. Uh, they've been a, historically a fantastic partner um, to the safety and justice team, but also specifically have provided uh, quite a bit of guidance to our team and, and continued support uh, for this program. And we anticipate that um, uh, to, to be a part of the work uh, moving forward. And so for the sake of time, I'll, I'll uh, conclude there, um, but happy to answer questions at the end of the of the event and I believe also we'll be sharing uh, contact information and uh, happy to have follow up uh, conversations uh, with interested applicants. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Samantha. Great, thank you, John. <clears throat> um, I did see just a quick question while John was speaking about the link uh, to the rural program um, that's at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we will put that link in the chat for you all who are interested in that. Um, and then I do see some other questions regarding funding um, and match requirements, and we will be getting to that. So I promise you I've seen your question um, and I will uh, we'll chat about that a little bit when we get to the budgeting slide. All right, so now you've heard um, about the partners that are a part of this team. So what is that team going to do for you as an RBCRI grantee if you're awarded? Uh, one, we will provide comprehensive recommendations to help ensure that what you're proposing um, in your narratives is accomplished. 
Um, we will create a repository of evidence-based best practices, um, which we have done by starting the uh, ruralvcri.org website. Um, and that will be updated on a regular basis with new resources. We have tried to target those resources to those um, to rural agencies. We will help you support the establishment of clear data collection processes to measure those outcomes. Uh, we'll provide grant management support like we discussed before. Um, I think you heard from both uh, John Markovic at BJA and Amanda, as well as John Connolly at LISC, that uh, we have tried to make this grant process um, one that is simple and manageable for all agencies. We will conduct regular uh, check-in meetings with grantees to track progress and identify any available TTA and peer learning opportunities, um, so TTA as well as training and technical assistance. Um, and those peer opportunities in TTA could involve um, implementing community engagement strategies. Um, it could talk about enhancing your crime analysis capacity. Maybe you're interested in um, you know, pulling or analyzing data in a new way or using a new type of software. Um, it can really run the range here of topics uh, that you may be interested in. So now you've heard about what the program is from an overview perspective and you've met the team. So who is eligible to be an RVCRI grantee? Um, that And that is pretty broad. So it is any publicly funded rural law enforcement agency, local or county law enforcement agency that serves a rural population, any federally recognized tribal law enforcement agency, or any rural county prosecutor's office who is looking to address a rural violent crime program or problem. As you heard from John Markovic, um, rural is a broad definition. Um, so your entire jurisdiction does not need to be classified as rural, but you would need to target a rural area within your jurisdiction. So if you are a large county um, that spans probably uh, municipalities or townships, and you also have unincorporated areas, the entire county would not need to be classified as rural. We do have tools on our website to act as a guide to help you determine if you are rural. If you have any questions um, or if that tool deems you as ineligible, please reach out to us. We're happy to talk through eligibility and to determine if you are in fact eligible to apply for the rural grant program. Know that that is a guide. So if you were to be awarded an RVCRI grant, uh, what would be your responsibilities? Um, one would be to engage in regular contact um, with your TTA provider and funder, so either the National Policing Institute or LISC, uh, to provide regular reporting updates, which might include crime metrics, depending on your program, that allow for comparisons um, you know, prior to the program being implemented during and then at the end. Uh, and again, we're here to support you with that, to help you determine what is the best way to collect that, um, what's the easiest way to collect that as well. To help you purchase the equipment and services in a manner compliant with federal and local procurement guidelines. Um, so we do need to make sure that we're following those guidelines, but again, we are here to support you through that. To help you request reimbursement for your purchases through the award. Um, and here's where I'll answer some of those questions. It is a reimbursement grant. However, there is no match requirement um, for this award. You, the reimbursement and invoicing guidelines of the grant will be supplied to you if you are awarded so that you can follow those. And again, each organization is more than happy to walk you through that process and assist you as you do those for the first time. We are required to follow all special conditions and government requirements of receiving a grant. And again, those will be listed in any award packages. Um, we will help you understand those and walk through that process as well to make sure that everyone is following all compliance purposes. And then contribute to developing annual and or a final report that discusses your project progress, the successes that you achieved, potentially any challenges that you experienced um, and how you overcame those, and then sustainability of the program or project. Um, you will work closely with the providers to help develop that. Um, so don't feel like that will be something that you have to take on on your own. So how do you apply to become a grantee? Um, you would visit the ruralvcri.org website um, there's a screenshot on the right there of the home page just so that you know that you're in the right spot. Um, you will review the questions underneath the um, application requirements accordion that's on that page to determine which application to apply under, either the National Policing Institute or LISC. Um, each application has very similar requirements in terms of application questions, uh, the submission of a proposal narrative, and a budget. 
and then you'll submit that completed application to us. If you do have questions along the way as you're looking at the application or you have questions as you're filling it out, please feel free to reach out to us. Again, we're happy to help you uh, complete that application and answer any questions that you might have. So what, com what makes up a completed application is going to be one, responses to all of the application questions. Um, a short proposal narrative that describes the problem that you're looking to address, how you'll address that problem, and then how you'll uh, categorize and track program impact and sustainability. Um, there are two ways that you can do that. Um, it's either directly through the application itself or using the provided template. Um, if you use the provided Word template, we do ask uh, that they be no longer than four pages. You'll also submit a budget outlining uh, what you are looking for funding for. Um, each item will have its own entry line, and those will be entered directly into the application itself. And so some of that information you can see here on this slide there in terms of breakdowns of the budget and the narrative. For the narrative portion, there will be three sections you'll be asked to fill out, um, which I highlighted a little bit earlier, but the exact titles of those are the description of the issue, your project design and implementation, and then your plan for measuring success and sustainability. For the budget piece, um, for each item that you do enter, you will be asked to provide a description or a short justification for each proposed expenditure that you are outlining there. And then I did see we had some questions related to what are allowable costs under the RVCRI. Um, so here on the screen, you can see a few examples of things that would be allowable. I, I'm not gonna read through all of them, but a few of them would be, if you were looking uh, to develop or acquire an offender-based risk assessment tool to better um, focus your investigations, interventions, and enforcement efforts, um, if you were looking to mitigate the risk for violent behavior in individuals dealing with mental health and or substance use disorders, including those crisis intervention programs or CIT services that I had mentioned earlier that another grantee is doing, um, you can use it to acquire forensic tools and softwares for identifying suspects and enhancing evidence, testimony, and outreach to victims. Um, and again, the list, um, there are other examples there on the slide. Um, essentially, there are nine categories that budgets would fall into or that uh, allowable expenses would fall into. Personnel, hardware, software, equipment, training, travel expenditures, uh, consultants, if you were bringing on somebody to do an assessment, for you, contracts, partners, and subawards, and then we do have an other category if it's needed. Um, some of what would be considered an unallowable cost are any pre-award costs or expenditures, um, land acquisition, construction, any firearms or ammunition, armored vehicles, and then any other tactical equipment that would be used strictly for enforcement purposes. Those would be unallowable expenses under the program. So um, we do have a couple of sample budgets here, just so that you can see some from a high level of what would be allowed. Um, so in this budget here, you'll see that um, a this agency is requesting funding for a crime analyst, um, as well as equipment for that crime analyst, including a computer, crime mapping software, training for not only that analyst, but also that analyst supervisor, as well as a few technologies in here. They wanna purchase some poll cameras to put up in three different locations um, and over time for patrol and crime hotspots that they've identified. Um, so this budget is just showing you here an example of some of the allowable costs, as well as that you can uh, request reimbursement or request for funding in multiple categories, right? So here we have personnel, we have equipment, and we have technology um, in here as well as overtime hours. So there's one budget example. The second budget example here is looking at somebody for a crisis intervention team. So in this example, the agency is looking to support a program manager at 20% of their time, as well as a coordinator for this team, and then to support training for four deputies at the sheriff's office. Um, and then the last item that they're requesting reimbursement for is salary for a mental health co-responder at a half-time capacity. So again, here you can see this one is, is asking for re, uh, funding in a couple of different categories, personnel, as well as training for these officers and team members. So now we're gonna open up our second poll for the day, and that is, what are you hoping to fund if awarded an RVCRI grant? Um, 
As a reminder here, the categories and the answer options will correspond to those. They'll, they'll appear on your screen shortly are personnel, hardware and software, equipment, training, travel, consultants, contracts, partners and sub awards, and then you do have an other option if it's needed. All right, so we will give everyone a few seconds to respond to that. All right, looks like equipment may be coming out as one of the top choices here right now, followed pretty closely by personnel, hardware and software, and then training. All right. Great, okay. All right, so it looks like about 76% of you who responded are looking for equipment. 53% um, are looking for uh, personnel costs. 50% at hardware and software and training is at 45%. And you were able to pick multiple categories, so um, great. Thank you all for taking the, uh, taking the time to answer that poll for us. All right, I think we can close that one out. So when are applications due? Um, the RVCRI application is always going to remain open. We will be taking applications on a rolling cohort basis. Um, so as long as the program um, is available, the application will remain open, but we will be reviewing applications on, and awarding on a quarterly basis. Um, so the first cohort deadline is going to be December 15th of this year, um, and then deadlines will follow in a quarterly fashion after that um, for the 2023 calendar year. Um, if you do not make that December 15 deadline, uh, please don't worry, there, there are additional opportunities to apply as well. So how can you contact us if you do have any remaining questions after uh, today's solicitation webinar? We've listed a few of our contacts on there from the Institute. Uh, you can email us at our rural VCRI at Policing Institute email or reach out to myself and my colleague Reginald directly. Um, our phone numbers and email addresses are listed there. And then from LISC, uh, John Connolly would be your point of contact and he has listed his phone number and email address as well for you all to access. Um, additional application application resources in terms of um, the templates that I mentioned for the proposal narrative, um, things like that are on each of the application portals for you to access. Um, so you will have those right at your fingertips as you um, apply for those. And we are always happy to provide any additional resources that folks need, so please feel free to reach out to us. Um, with that, I did want to leave ample time, since it is a, a grant funding opportunity webinar, to address questions um, from the field and from folks. Um, so I do see that we have quite a few actually waiting in the uh, in the Q&A feature here, so I'm going to start with those. Um, and the first one that I see here is, are drones and in-car cameras allowable purchases? Um, so I will weigh in as well, um, but I will first let John Markovic at BJA open up to that one. So John? Yeah, just to be clear, drones are not allowable under federal funding. That um, was the case for the direct funded award. So it's also the case here for the micro grant awards. Drones are not fundable. In-car cameras are fundable, but in your application, you have to make a nexus that it is connected to and will impact and hopefully reduce the violent crime problem. So um, you can't just say we have a violent crime problem and we want to get in-car cameras. You you'll be assessed on the degree to which you um, establish that nexus between in-car cameras and how they can be how they can be used specifically to help you address the violent crime problem. And you know you should set forth a plan that you'll do that in a way that will hopefully reduce violent crime problem. And then should you be awarded, the TTA providers would help you assess that impact. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think um, tying, tying your funding requests to your program as well, as John mentioned, um, for any costs, for any proposed expenditure, um, we will be looking for that in applications to show that direct tie to your program and how it's going to address rural violent crime. Um, great, thank you, John. Um, so I see another question here related to eligibility and the definition of rural. Um, 
And the question specifically is related to state funded agencies. Um, are state funded agencies allowed to apply? Um, so it, it is going to depend on the jurisdiction that you're serving, right? We said at the beginning, you need not be, ex need not be exclusively rural but you do need to have a rural population and the funding would need to be focused on that population there. Um, so John, Amanda, we have two John. So John M, John C or Amanda, would anybody else like to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I would say this, while state agencies are, can apply, I mean, this is really geared towards agencies that, you know, have historically, not gotten federal funding or wouldn't be you know as savvy or advanced in seeking federal funding so i think a state agency you can apply uh, but keep in mind that the the emphasis is on sort of a addressing rural crime and b on helping those agencies that have not historically been um competitive in funding we're thinking you know like the smaller sheriff's departments or um small municipal police departments serving rural areas that uh, you know just don't have um, a grants person um, so we're really there this is kind of the purpose of this program is to help them yeah, absolutely related to that uh, we have a, a district attorney's office representative on the line today that is uh, with a county agency who is classified as eligible by the tool online um, and they, their question is, are they eligible to apply? Uh, we, we do allow for county prosecutors and district attorney's offices that are serving a rural population to apply. So um, yes, I would encourage you to apply to the award if you're deemed eligible by the tool. Yes. May I add to that? Yes, absolutely. It, it, as Sam has said a couple of times at this point, um, if the tool is telling you that you are not eligible, but you have a very specific mission or, or program in mind around your, the rural part of your jurisdiction, we would also encourage you to consider applying because I, I you know, some agencies are technically large, but um, serve a large rural area too. So um, don't go just by the tool, but yes, in this case, um, with this particular question, you were deemed eligible anyhow, so. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, our next um, question, it looks like it's pretty specific to an agency that um, appears to be too large to qualify for rural grants. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to us um, and give us a little information about your, your, your agency, um, and we can help walk through and see if you are in fact eligible for the program. Um, so do reach out to us at that rural VCRI um, email address. Our next question is, is there incentive for grantees to engage with the community to address prevention and diversion and not just enforcement? Um, I'm going to chime in a little bit and then I'm also going to turn over some colleagues here. Um, we do always encourage community engagement, right? You are, you are a public uh, service agency, so community engagement is a good component to have to your program. Um, I, I don't know that I would go so far as to say an incentive, but I do think it is an important piece to have there. Um, with that, I'll let John Connolly from LISC weigh in a little bit on that piece. John? Sure, thanks, Samantha. Uh, again, John Connolly, Senior Program Officer with LISC. Uh, I would say not, not an incentive, but definitely on, on the LISC side for applications, we'll definitely be looking for, and, and our application portal specifically has questions around, do you plan to uh, engage the community around uh, the problem analysis component of your work and or the strategy selection component of your work. Uh, and if you take uh, a look at uh, our website, you'll see we um, heavily focus on supporting groups um, that engage in alternatives uh, to incarceration programming, uh, programming support for uh, re returning citizens. Um, as well as support for uh, CBIPI, which is Community Violence Intervention and Prevention uh, uh, Initiative um, efforts, um, which really does speak to the um, diversion uh, prevention and intervention component that, that was um, indicated in, in the question. So I would say definitely if those are areas of interest for you as you're considering an application, uh, we would on, on the list side definitely welcome that. 
Uh, and if you have further questions around uh, how to put together an application that includes those components, I, I'd be happy to, to have uh, additional um, uh, discussions with, with prospective applicants. And let me chime in there. I definitely, we'd encourage those holistic approaches. And I think tying into other questions, I see Jason King has you know, the definition of a violent crime uh, referring to our IBR classifications. We don't have a rigid definition of violent crime. It's really, and it's, you know, we're kind of defining it more broadly as violent crime problems. So for instance, um, you might have a, you know, in rural areas, providing services to domestic violence uh, victims is often difficult um, because of a lot of reasons in the literature, but you know, there's the lack of anonymity that you might have in an urban area. There's not um, as many resources. Um, so um, to provide specific outreach and plans to develop um, more holistic or responsive uh, responses to domestic violence that um, you know overcome some of those rural challenges would be something that would definitely fit under the spirit of this grant program. So we're, we're not, you know, um, we're not saying you have to, some other programs we have sort of a precipitous increase in crime or a violent crime threshold that you need to be, um, you know, X percent above or, you know, some percentile above the national average. That's not the case with, with this program. Um, it's really more open to violent crime problems. Again, you know, you use your narrative to make the case that there is a violent crime issue that you're dealing with and that the program and the funds that you are proposing have a nexus to that violent crime issue. And again, will be used in an attempt to reduce violent crime or the violent crime problem. So you might, you know, the problem might be the lack of services for domestic violence victims. So your goal uh, might, you know, hopefully be to reduce domestic violence, but it's also the more immediate goal of providing better services for uh, domestic violence victims. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think, uh, John, those are some great examples. And I think that hit on another question that we had in the chat as well about what crimes or crime categories um, would be applicable for the grant. So I think that that just answered both of those. And um, to highlight a few examples of some current grantees that we have, uh, John highlighted the domestic violence example. We do have several um, agencies that that is their focus is domestic, or domestic violence and services to those victims. Um, within their jurisdictions and on tribal lands. Um, and we have others that are focusing on um, somewhat related uh, occasionally is uh, narcotics trafficking and its ties to violent crimes, right? While narcotics tra trafficking in and of itself is not a violent crime, it often has ties to other crimes that are that are violent. Um, so those are a couple of examples. And then um, we do have others focusing right on, a, on assaults or things like that, uh, that we're typically classified as violent crimes. So those are a few examples of current grantees um, and their focus areas. Our next question that we have is, what is the size of the grant awards, the duration of the grant period, and a matrix for awarding points for applications? So the size of the grant awards will range from $25,000 to $150,000. Um, and the maximum grant period is going to be for up to two years. Um, so there is those uh those two for you and as far as the matrix for awarding points um we will be evaluating all applications um in the in the quarterly um time frames that we talked about so it will be competitive in that nature um but there is not an available matrix for points allocations for applications um would anybody else john or amanda um like to chime in on that well i wanted to kind of uh add to what john markovic mentioned in the last uh, response, uh, I, I believe, you know, part of our hope is that we can be leveraged, the uh, training and technical assistance partners can be leveraged in a way that enhances your programming. So we would encourage seeing you look at ways to in, include a problem solving um, strategy within your um, application. So, you know, it, there are several questions in the chat looking at, you know, is overtime uh, allowable? The answer is yes, it's allowable, but um, 
you know, we want to see how you're using that over time and what type of um, initiatives they're going to be, uh, you know, kind of going after that they can't currently do with your existing funding or staffing levels. So I think, you know, the more holistic you think about your, your programming, um, if you're looking at uh, buying technology or or potentially uh adding equipment or cameras or things like that think about please think about the training that's involved and the analysis that might be involved with pulling that data from those those pieces or um you know just things like that and be inclusive in your uh grant application of some of those elements so that we can we can see that you're appreciating you know that this is a an investment and that you're going you're planning to uh, maintain that uh, sustainability over time even beyond uh the the reaches of our our work with you but please also know that some of that does not have to exist currently in your agency you have us as training and technical assistance partners in this process to help bring some of that training uh, to your agency. Great. Thanks, Amanda. John Connolly, anything from the LISC side on that question before I move forward? Oh, I think I'm good. Okay. Perfect. Let me interject here, Sam, a little bit because yeah. I see a few questions about population cutoff and population size. So yeah. we don't, there's no question on that. Again, it's sort of the idea is that you you could be, uh, I just used the example because I've worked with um, the Harris County Sheriff's Office, uh, which surrounds Houston, um, which has many highly urban areas as well as rural areas. So if you were to apply as an agency such as that, you would need to make the case that your, um, that the problem that you're addressing is in a rural area and it's affecting rural population. So uh, we don't have, you know, a cut off, a, a definition or a population cutoff per se. But the next is that sort of establishment of rurality or ruralness. Uh, rurality is a tough word to say. Uh, needs to be established in your in your application. And um, you know the. Um, there is a tool where you can check whether or not you, you qualify as rural based on um, some census related, rate, related definitions, but um, there's also the TTA providers, NPI, National Policing Institute, and LISC are there to help you sort of navigate that because we realize it's a open-ended and, and nebulous definition. Yes. yes, thanks, John. Yes, absolutely. Please, um, John just said it, but again, if you have any questions about eligibility for your agency after this webinar and you want to talk to us specifically, please reach out. We're here to help. Um, okay, our next question is, after an application is submitted, what is the process? How long does it take to hear back and how long does it take to receive the funding? Um, so that's a great question. Um, we will be evaluating um, and reviewing uh, applications pretty quickly after the December 15th um, cohort deadline, and we will get those awards out as quickly as possible and notifications. Um, if you are notified uh, that you that your award was selected and awarded, you will be asked to respond pretty quickly in terms of if you plan to accept the award uh, post notification there. Um, John, anything on the John Connolly, anything on the list side that you would like to add in terms of the award uh, notification process? Yeah, I would just echo. We will uh, do our very best to to make um, funding decisions um, quickly, and then follow up with folks and anticipate uh, awards uh, early in the new year. Um, uh, yeah. Perfect. Great, thanks, John. Um, and I think that that same statement will apply. Um, I haven't seen all the questions yet, but I'm sure there is in terms of reimbursement when you do request uh, for the funding reimbursement. Uh, both agencies will try to make those as uh, quickly and efficiently as we possibly can. Um, so there's that piece. Our next question is, um, again, an, an allowable cost question. So we have two here. One, are vehicles an allowable cost? And two, are recurring costs such as yearly software licensing um, an allowable cost? If so, for how long will those be funded? 
Um, so for the yearly softwares, um, some of those can be supported. For instance, if it's a crime mm -hmm. analytics or an evidence collection software, uh, we can support those. Again, the maximum will be for up to two years uh, for each grant. So um, you would want to discuss sustainability internally at your agency in terms of how you'll continue to pay for that licensing software once the award is passed. Um, and then in terms of vehicles, uh, John Markovic, would you like to chime in on that one? I'll chime in on both of them. I think in terms of the software, you know, the expenditure needs to occur within the grant period. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, you, you know, you couldn't pay for licensing outside the grant award period. Um, you know, that, that's something that we deal with normally with our direct funded grant as well. And so we'll work with you to sort of um, define that um, and, you know, perhaps readjust your budget if for some reason you're outside the grant period. Um, you know, vehicles are eligible, but I'll be honest with you, I think, you know, you I don't immediately nothing comes to mind as a clear nexus as to how that would be used to reduce rural violent crime. There may be some, um, but you know, just keep that in mind. Um, you know, you'll I think you'll, this is going to be competitive, so you can apply. Um, but the stronger that nexus is between what your receiving funding for and addressing uh, you know a real rural violent crime problem in a meaningful way um, the better the more likely you are to be funded so um, we you know, we could have had the option to say we're going to fund x y and z but we wanted to leave it kind of organic for the agencies to come up with what those problems are what their proposed solutions are um, because we you know, frankly, this is a new area and there's not as much known in academia, but I think in other literature about rural violent crime, we were um, specifically the appropriation was to address rural violent crime. We launched our rural violent crime reduction initiative in which we funded 21 sites directly. Um, and we're learning a lot from them, um, but we didn't want to be prescriptive in saying, um, these are things you can and cannot do. So we're leaving it up to you and working with um, LISC and NPI on sort of um, you know, providing that um, narrative that would convince that there's a nexus there. So uh, we're not ruling things out up front, except for things like drones, which are, are you know, things that we, we don't allow under federal funding. and. Um, and ammunition and so some other things that we um, that we did decide were prohibited under this grant. But um, so I think you know it's up to you to make the case. Great, thanks, John. Uh, we do have a, another question here. Do you see about is overtime eligible for investigating homicides and sexual or an aggravated assaults as well as? related to domestic violence, which is on the rise. Um, again, yes, overtime and personnel hours can be funded. However, as, as John mentioned with the previous example, um, tying it how into how it will directly impact the violent crime problem that you are looking to address um, will be critical when evaluating your application. Um, and we would just also encourage you to think, right, in addition to personnel, um, are there other are there other avenues or technologies or things like that that would also help support um, your violent crime uh, reduction initiative within your communities? Our next question is, how would we show that we are, are a rural sheriff's office? Um, so you'll want to do that through your proposal narrative um, in this in the initial section where you're talking about um, your community, your jurisdiction and the, the violent crime problem that you are looking to address or multiple. It could be it could be multiple um, problems or issues that you are hoping to achieve uh, with this grant. Um, so I would recommend um, really detail, you know, describing your community a little bit. Um, if you are a county sheriff's office uh, where you maybe cover a large jurisdiction that maybe has small municipalities or towns in there, um, and maybe not all of it is considered rural, really highlight how you're going to focus your efforts on those rural parts of your county or on those rural parts of your jurisdiction. Um, would any of my other fellow panelists like to add anything to that? 
Okay. All right. Um, our next question is related to eligibility. Our town is rural with just over a thousand residents. Um, would we qualify? Um, so I would recommend um, you can use the tool as a guideline um, without knowing your city name um, there where you're located. It would be hard for me to address right now. Um, but if you do have questions or you want to reach out to us to determine if your um, agency specifically qualifies, feel free to email us at ruralbcri.org. Uh, or at nationalpolicinginstitute.com um, or visit us on the website at ruralbcri.org. Um, I do see Amanda, looks like she would like to add to this. Yes, there are a couple of other similar questions. Um, again, in your narrative, if you are addressing a rural violent crime issue in a rural area of your jurisdiction, that's how I would um, really approach that. So talking about a very specific area of your community or um, you know, section of your jurisdiction that you would like to address uh, particular issues in, uh, that can be highlighted in the narrative portion of your uh, program narrative. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, we, we, we have a collaboration question here. So um, this individual works for a DA's office who is working with uh, rural PDs. Uh, they do. They would like to allocate some funds uh, to the police for equipment. Would that be allowable? And how would that work? Would it be a sub award? Um, one of the funding categories is partners and sub awards. So if you do have a collaboration like that, you would in the budget outline them um, underneath that, um, and you would want to describe what that partnership is. Um, you know what that funding would be used for, and you would also want to clearly outline that in your narrative when you submit that as well. Um, any of my other panelists would like to add to that? No, but I, I think um, this goes with uh, similar to that question. Um, the amount of awards, we talked about the size of the awards can be from 25K to 150,000. Um, we currently are looking to uh, award anywhere from, 30 to 150 agencies this uh, funding. So depending on the size of the awards um, that are requested, certainly uh, it's hard for us to give you a hard and fast number of how many we might be able to uh, award out. But just uh, for those of you who are looking for uh, kind of the, the scope of the overall funding for this initiative, it's quite large. And we would uh, encourage you uh, to apply as there are poten you know, potentially over 100 awards that are, will be given out. Absolutely. Yes. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, we do have a question here. It's another eligibility question. Um, this agency has received a federal grant for a program that they would like to start that's going to combat their violent crime, human and drug trafficking, as well as hot spots in their rural county. They've yet to implement this because they are still um, waiting on an unfunded portion of the program. Would they be eligible to apply for this award to supplement uh, to cover that unfunded portion. Um, I do not have the name of the other award. It's not in the question. Um, so we can offer to follow up with you if you want to reach out to us directly to discuss um, that. We can do that. And then John Markovic, I don't know if you have any initial thoughts on that. Well, the way it, the question is phrased, it sounds allowable. I mean, what, you know, we're sort of, um, as a micro grant program, um, you didn't get the same type of solicitation language you would get if you were doing direct funding. And that direct funding would maybe mention that you can't supplant or it would point you to the grants financial guidance, um, which is a, you know, a, a, a detailed um, guide, including definitions of supplanting and things like that. So um, essentially, if you've budgeted for the material or the money is being provided by another grant, you, um, I'm sorry, if you, if, if, you, if you have a budget for the material, let's say you wanted to buy, I saw poll cameras in there and say, um, you wanted to buy poll cameras to increase surveillance and re, re, reduce, you know, with the idea that it would reduce violent crime, um, that's fine, but you can't say, well, we got this grant, now we're gonna use that money that was in our budget, our 
for um, something else. That would be supplanting. And it can't be duplicative of other grant programs. It can be additional or supplement other grant programs. So um, you know the funding has to be, um, it can't be supplanting. Um, the existing grant. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. It Great. can't be duplicative of something else. You can't um, obviously fund the same three three cameras twice, for instance. Probably that's right. I'm not sure I'm giving a clear example there, but we can help you with the definitions of supplanting. And if you have questions on whether you're augmenting or duplicating a grant or um, with the, the goal of being augmenting it, um, we can help you with that. That's again, we're you know um, here to help you, uh, particularly those agencies that have not had federal grant experience and are not grant savvy. Absolutely. Great. Yes. Thank you, John. And, and again, like John said, if you do have additional questions based on that specific example, um, feel free to send us an email and we can discuss it further and, and walk through that. Um, I do see we have a follow up here on the how would we show that we are a rural sheriff's office question. Um, does the application ask for population numbers? We are also a rural sheriff's office. Um, so we do not ask for specific population numbers as a part of your application. However, again, what we would stress, for, especially for the sheriff's offices that cover counties or larger jurisdictions, um, is really highlighting in your proposal narrative, um, if your entire jurisdiction is not rural, how you will focus on those rural areas. Um, there are, uh, the tool, as John mentioned, is on the website as a guideline as well. Um, but if you do have any questions as you're working through that, um, feel free to reach out to us. For the sheriff's offices, I would say that um, just making sure you really highlight um, your community and if it isn't, if it is a mixture of rural and, and urban -er areas, um, to make sure you highlight how you're going to focus on the rural aspects of it. Our next question is, are prosecutors offices held to the same standards given that they are serving entire counties. Again, there for the prosecutor's offices, since you are serving a broader jurisdiction, you're going to want to tie your proposal narrative into how it's gonna focus on the rural parts of your communities, of the communities that you are serving there. Um, any, would anyone else like to add to that? Okay. All right, I think we have a question for John Connolly from LISC here. Um, can a CDC be the applicant slash grantee or does it have to be the public entity? Gotcha, yeah, so as, as Samantha kind of outlined it at the very beginning of the presentation around eligibility, it does have to be a local law enforcement entity, though on, on the LISC side, we would strongly again encourage those community partnerships when appropriate and so could a police department contract to a community development corporation or could a district attorney's office um, uh, contract and sub award to a CDC yes um, and and frankly on the list side that's that's definitely something that we would encourage but you would need to work with your local law enforcement agency to be the the lead applicant for the purposes of of the application great thanks Sean mm -hmm. All right, couple of funding um, eligibility questions here. I'm gonna I'm gonna bucket a couple of together since we're reaching the end of time here. Um, one is rental car costs for undercover surveillance operations in high crime areas. Would that be allowable? Um, non lethal weapon options are those allowable expenses? And then the third one that I will put in here is poll cameras to reduce uh, suicide problems that an agency is experiencing in their local parks. Uh, would that be an allowable expense? So three three questions there. Um, would anybody like to weigh in? I know uh, I've been speaking a lot, so I'm just giving others the opportunity here. I would say all those are allowable costs. Again, it's a competitive grant program. So you being able to draw a clear and convincing nexus between how those rental cars will help you address a violent crime problem in a meaningful way um, you know, it would be incumbent on you to make that case. Perfect. All right. Thanks, John. Um, last question that I think we'll be able to take, and then we'll need to close out for today. I know we still have several questions in the chat and the Q&A, so if we didn't get to your question, please email us. We're happy to answer them. 
Um, how many years of data or crime stats does the agency have to submit with the application? Um, so data and crime stats like that are not a required portion of the application. However, um, they are encouraged if you're able to provide some, um, just because it does help give context uh, to the problem or issue you're looking to address, as well as you know how you will track those that impact for your program over time. Uh, but there is no required um, you know, amount of data that you would have to put in there in terms of number of years or things like that, um, or specific crime metrics. It's going to depend on the the area that you are looking to address. Um, yeah, let me chime in quickly, Sam. I, yeah, that's a great question. I think you know some of our grant programs or other grant programs are based on a certain level of violent crime. Let's say you know in the 90th percentile, of, you know, compared to the federal rates. Um, but that's not the case here. We wanted to leave it open to address a wide variety of rural crime problems. So for instance, using the example, you may have a persistent violent, uh, domestic violence crime problem, and um, you may wanna quantify that in some terms. That's always helpful, rather than to say we have a real, you know, we just have a big problem that we need to deal with. If you're able to quantify it, you know, as a per capita rate, and then, you know, discuss in specific terms on what the problems are, maybe providing services to those domestic violence victims or what some of the challenges are. Um, um, providing numbers is always good. It's not required, but um, if you can quantify things, that's always helpful. Yes. So, you know, um, maybe, you know, if you're a small jurisdiction, um, you know, defining you know, how large that problem is relative to your population or a per capita rate would be helpful. And if you can compare it to national data, that's fine. But um, I think there are some problems that you may need help with that aren't easily quantifiable in, in terms of traditional crime rates, like the domestic violence. You know, um, you may say you, you know, there's a, this many people awaiting services or, um, domestic violence, you know, um, some place in a safe shelter and things like that. So we're really trying to understand better how rural violent crime is unique, how it's different than, often different than urban crime. Um, it's not just the same as urban crime in a different area. Um, there's, you know, relatively little literature on rural crime. So we're, you know, um, We've left it pretty open for that reason, rather than to be very, very prescriptive and say, here are 10 types of rural violent crimes that we're interested in addressing. Great. Thank you, John, for adding that in. Um, we do want to thank you all for attending today. I know we still had a couple of questions in the chat and the Q&A that uh, some of our panelists are responding to right now. Um, but if we aren't able to get to your question, um, again, please feel free to reach out to us. I've put uh, the contact information back on the screen for folks um, in case you weren't able to capture it earlier. You can capture it now. Um, and again, we will make this recording available on the Rural VCRI uh, website. Uh, so it's ruralvcri.org, um, and we will send out a notice once that recording is available for folks. Um, but again, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to answer them, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon.